who's going to be providing an overview of bluff recession issues and challenges. So Tony, their virtual floor is all yours. Thank you, Sean. You can see my screen, right? Okay, great. So yes, what we'll give you what we're doing today is we're going to take a tour of the the bluff coastline of Northwest Pennsylvania, looking at uh, basically how they're built, um, how they work, you know, how the, why they retreat over time. Uh, some new newer findings from the West County that came out relatively recently, and then we'll also look at some hazard mitigation options from around the Great Lakes Basin and on the west coast of the U.S. And then we'll finish up with some uh, take-home messages. So this is a picture of our coastline, and you, if you can see my cursor, uh, we run from the New York state line here on the right down to the Ohio state line <clears throat> and Conneaut Harbor um, on the on the left. So we'll be looking. Our bluffs occur essentially in these two long boxes. So this one here and this one here, we got open lakefront bluffs. And then in a small box in the middle, we also have bluffs, but they're at least protected by uh, Presque Isle Bay. Okay, so I'm what I'm doing today is reporting out essentially some information we, we, we prepare, we got together for this document. So if you wanna read more, this was a, a document prepared for uh, DEP as part of a grant we are working on <clears throat> the state of knowledge for the Bluff Coast of Pennsylvania. So it's pretty long. It's available on pawalter.psu.edu. I think it's probably also available on the Sea Grant sites if you're interested at your leisure reading through parts of this. If you live on the lakefront and you want more technical information, uh, it might help you out on that. Okay, so we'll start off looking at some of the, you know, the big events in bluff science on our coastline over the past um, decades to centuries, but we have a, a 73 kilometer long bluff coast and, and they're all soft materials, unconsolidated. They can get pretty tall, they're up to about 180 feet tall. They can be as low as by definition, uh, about one and a half meters, that's about four or five feet. Uh, erosion has been prevalent and variable since 1878 in terms of, um, you know, when it occurs, where it occurs and how fast it occurs. And you're asking why 1878? Well, that's about as far back as the data goes. That's the U.S. Lake Survey uh, charts that the Corps of Engineers would have been involved in you know, pre their predecessors and they were able to map out bluff crest locations for that uh, time long ago. And then more recently, uh, the Erie County Hazard Mitigation Plan from 2012 uh, did some work and that highlighted that we had at the time, we have about 265 buildings and properties at risk of either total or partial um, <clears throat> damage or destruction over the next century. So there's about $66 million in property and, and land surface at risk, you know, going out for about a century. Uh, historically, Pennsylvania DEP has done a lot of uh, bluff monitoring when this, when it first started, you know, in an organized fashion in the late 70s, early 80s. And every four years, they monitored the bluff crest location at about um, every 500 meter interval intervals along our coastline. So they've got a lot of data points that continuously uh, monitor and keep track of how bad or how good the, the problem is. Um, when we look at the average rates change for, for the Pennsylvania coast, it's about 0.15 meters per year or a half a foot per year um, over using those four decades of data that they've been compiling. Okay, so we've there's other numbers. I mean, if we change the time frames a little bit, maybe it goes up to maybe some of the highest rates might be a meter a year. Sometimes we'll see a bluff retreat. We might see in the course of a month, maybe seven or 10 meters or more, 20 meters of bluff retreat relatively suddenly. Uh, so PADP uh, uses their data and uses their data to define bluff recession hazard areas and also to, to define construction setbacks along the lakefront. Uh, and then since, you know, since that happened, that's, that started essentially again in the 80s and was the, the bluff recession hazard areas, if I remember correctly, were updated in the early 2000s. Uh, DEP is also monitoring the coast now with high resolution LIDAR data. So the state um, flies uh, LIDAR coverage every so often. So that kind of started in 1998. I think I've got that date right. And then most recently, the Corps of Engineers just did a lake-wide, at least for the U.S. coast side of the lake, a lake-wide sediment budget program that came out in 2016, a big long document. And that's sediment budgets. That's, you know, sand in the near shore and surf zone, but that's important because a lot of that sand comes from the bluffs. And, you know, if we know about sand volumes moving along the coast, that tells us things like, you know, our Presque Isle State Park, for example, at risk of more erosion or less erosion. 
So um, yeah, this project I'm, we're using today, essentially that, that was DEP funded. And as part of that, we were looking at um, figuring out bluff change rates at 20 meter intervals along the coast. So pretty high resolution compared to the normal historical uh, 500 meter intervals we used. And also bluff erosion potential mapping. So mapping out bluff, uh, bluff hazard zones, essentially. Uh, using a different approach from what DEP normally uses. Uh, results in that will be coming out in the February 26th webinar with a lot of new information on the erosion rates for bluffs. And then on the April 30th webinar, which will be looking at the bluff erosion uh, potential index. And then today I'll also report a little bit on some Pennsylvania Sea Grant funded bluff retreat sediment supply modeling uh, results, which are, which are interesting because they reveal new information on how and how, how, how the bluffs erode in terms of which watersheds are the, are the most erosional, how much sand is going into the littoral zone. So I'm gonna use this a very useful plot that DEP produces showing us because we'll, get, we'll have our data um, on the next webinar in February, but this is uh, DEP compiled data and it shows our coastline. So we go from Ohio on the left here up to New York on the right. Uh, these are their sample points. And what it's showing us is essentially here the, the rates are broken down by a municipality on this bar graph and you can see erosion is most, most dramatic in the western part of the county, obviously pretty low in Erie here because we were protected by the bay and then picks up again as we go further east. And then you can, <clears throat> their data is also broken down into some of these, these um, observation points they use and you can see like for Springfield Township, the rate, you know, the rates varies and you'll see that all across our coastline rates can get pretty high relatively, these are all feet per year, averaged, or they can be pretty low. And this is a snapshot for data up through 2011. But if, if we looked at a version of this, you know, compared, you know, brought up to date, uh, it, it might look different. So it looks different on the, depending on the time frame you use because the rates of erosion are so variable. Again, it's our time window we look at, that'll give us, give us different rates. If we change our location, we'll get different rates. So like, like bluff coastlines on, around the planet in general, these, bluffs are, are very hard to predict what they're going to do and where the worst erosion is going to be and so on. <clears throat> so we'll move on and look at the geology picture a little bit. Now this is actually the toe of a bluff out in the West County. It almost looks like this is man-made. It looks like two concrete um, walls sitting on top of one another, but that's our classic glacial till that makes up a large portion of our bluffs. And just looking at the beach, uh, we also have shale. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> that breaks up in the near shore. We tend to have very co uh, cobbly or gravelly or bouldery uh, beaches with, with sand. Or conversely, the beaches aren't even there anymore because they erode away uh, during high lake levels, which we'll talk a bit about today too. So our geology is a uh, nice simple picture is we've got, we've got tall bluffs and, and if we've got a complete stratigraphic section. We've got um, um, about 350 million year old shales at the base of the bluffs. These are Devonian shales, okay? So this stuff right here. And then sitting on top of those, we, we cross a big jump in time. We jump into sediments, these glacial uh, tills that are uh, less than about, let me see, do, 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 do. Yeah, two, these are less than 2 million years old, okay? So we, we've lost, there's a gap in the rock record here, for example. That's why people don't look for dinosaurs in Pennsylvania because we don't have Jurassic Age rocks here. So we go from bedrock, that can be up to seven meters tall, depending on where we are. We usually have two layers of till um, that erodes and you'll notice it's got a different slope to it and that's essentially a, a product of the geotechnical properties of the shale versus the till. And then on top of the till we have these lacustrine sediments which are younger again, they're about um, 18,000 years old and younger. Uh, they're former lake floor sediments when lake level used to be above this flat ground up here and if you're, if you're a local, the shorelines are up at route 20 and route 5. Okay, so we've got and then what's not, we don't see here just because it's not the right location. We sometimes have uh, a lot of gravels or pea gravels that have been used economically for uh, gravel pit mining in, in, in the county. Um, and they are essentially fossilized versions of, of Presque Isle that are much older. So when the lake used to be much higher than it is now, we had you know, something that looked like Presque Isle sitting in the Eastern half of our county. And there was also another one in the Western half out near Lake City, uh, for example. So that's our geology, You usually four or five uh, different layers, all with different geotechnical uh, properties. So how do our bluffs erode? This is a nice graphic produced by the US Geological Survey. It shows the major styles, okay? And, and we could say our bluffs erode just like everybody else's. 
Um, our bluffs are part of all of Lake Erie bluffs and it, it, the USGS examined how much of that coastline is bluffs and it's about 25%. So it's not just a problem unique to us or if you're a, a coastal property owner here, you, you know, you might feel, you know, why, why am I being picked on by bluffs? People all over the planet are picked on by bluffs. They just like to erode. Um, and the USGS classifies the bluff failure mechanisms by the type of material involved. So is it muddy, is it gravelly? Uh, the rate of movement, is it a rapid fall, like a topple or a rock fall? And then what's the water content? Because they'll dictate how, what, this thing, what these things look like on the land surface. Will it be something like spilled oatmeal or will it be you know, cubes of ice falling off a table? And we see most of these except two. We don't get the rock falls because we don't have enough rock for the most part. And we usually don't see debris avalanches. But we get things from, we see soil creep. These two are our most common big events. These uh, rotational slides that usually have a curved uh, head wall. They might only be like 10 to, I think biggest one might be about 200 meters in, in a long coast dimension. And then we have these translational slides, which are much bigger. They can extend over a kilometer, sometimes two kilometers in length along the coastline. So these are two big guys that cause a lot of problem for people and land loss. Um, and then we see you know, various degrees of, of the other ones. So, you know, what causes um, the, the problems we have? Well, we're looking at essentially two big forces. We're looking at wave attack and groundwater. We, in a nutshell, that's what's driving bluff failure on our coastline. And actually you could argue on most coastlines on the planet. Um, surface water also plays a role, but usually that's relatively small because think of when I say surface runoff, that means if you think of a waterfall, that's an extreme example of surface runoff. So surface runoff does do some work, but it, it, I think in our county, it's, it's groundwater is, is a big driver and also bluff failure. So when we look at a bluff then, this is um, just this bar here for scale, I think is, ooh, this is 15 feet, or each of the orange stripes on this survey rod are one foot. Um, <clears throat> we have upper slope slumping and crest retreat because groundwater busting out of the bluff face causes it to be unstable. And we get these major slumps up here. These are terrestrial processes that are happening on land. And then at the base, we have wave attack. So we get toe erosion. So what that means is we were, waves are attacking the toe of the bluff. They're, they're digging in there, excising it, and then eventually we get a huge overhang and then that overhang will fail. Because it turns out some of our, in our, in our county, the, the lower most, the lower till is actually very hard. It almost looks like rock. You, can, you wouldn't be able to push a pencil into it, it's that hard. Um, and it's fractured. So it's got planes of weakness in it. So when you start undercutting it, you get huge chunks of material just falling off that, that lower bluff face. So there are two mechanisms then. A bluff gets attacked from the top, gets attacked from the bottom. Um, so in eras when or decades when there's like lower lake levels, you think, wow, things should be fine, but it's possible during those lower lake level periods, there's a lot of groundwater coming out still, so you'll see erosion from the top. So it can do, it can play a tag team and sometimes they work together. So we see the problem being worst then when we have narrow beaches, because that allows waves to get to the bluff. Um, when we have high lake levels, in other words, we'll talk about a low toe today at some point. Um, that just means the toe of the bluff isn't sitting you know, that far above the lake level. Uh, abundant groundwater flux, and we, flux is a fancy term for how many, you know, say cubic meters or cubic feet of water come out of a, every square foot or every square meter of bluff face. And then if we have weak bluffs, if the, if the stratigraphic layers are not the strongest, maybe we've got a lot of those lacustrine sands or those pea gravels, they tend to fail pretty easily. Or if our bluffs are steep, you know, steeper slopes geologically are just less stable than flatter slopes. And towards the end, we'll see, you know, engineers actually use this concept to um, make bluffs safer. So here, this is a picture from the West County on the lower left, relatively low bluffs getting attacked by waves because the beach is narrow. And then out here, out here in the East County, we have groundwater driven failures to get these big, these are rotational slumps. Here's one on the left here. Here's one on the right. These are active uh, as of when the photograph was taken. And this is an older one. This one was here pre, definitely this is pre 1878. So some of these structures, eventually some of them destabilize and they, they, they become forests and people put houses in here and they become inactive, but right beside them might have newer ones popping up. So <clears throat> this is the best model of, of bluff retreat, believe it or not. It's a nice, uh, very conceptual model. It's still being tested. It was developed by Zuzek et al. back in 2003, especially for the Great Lakes. 
So what it tries to convey is that bluffs fail as part of a long-term cyclical retreat process. And by long-term, I mean decades at least. Okay, so this isn't something you'd notice from one year to the next for the most part, but over a longer time period, it's decades to multiple decades, this is how they uh, fail. So it's a failure cycle. So let's start you off in time one, you know, if this is our bluff top and maybe you've got a house up here, we've got a slope of time one, and then over time, waves will chew away at the toe of this. Yeah, the, only, the only thing about this diagram is it tends to be biased towards the wave-driven thing. It's not looking too much at what groundwater is doing, but ignoring that, waves will chew away at the toe of the bluff. So we're getting a, you know, a notch cut away here. And then by time two, you'll notice the bluff has steepened up a lot. Okay, so during that whole time period, you know, decade two or three, there's, there hasn't been much change up here in the bluff crest at all, but there's a lot of change occurring down here at the shoreline. Oops, gotta back that up. Um, <clears throat> so that's, you know, a relatively quiet period in terms of bluff erosion. Then suddenly the slope is, is, so, is so steep, it will actually fail. And that's what time three is. The bluff crest suddenly jumps back. All this material slumps down and heads out towards the lake. It builds out, it push the shoreline, lake or to where it was. And now we've got a sort of intermediate state of time three that's relatively stable. So you can see we've kind of gone from an era or a, a time period of no change to a time period of, of change. And then the whole cycle repeats. Now three will erode back to time four, and then eventually time four will jump to a time five, and the time five might bring the, the crest all the way back to here. So, so that's what we mean by a failure cycle. Bluffs will, in general, when we look at a longer term time frame, we'll, we'll do that. that. We'll have periods of not much going on, which is a geological sort of principle in general. And then time is when there's a lot of change and they alternate. But the way I think of that is if you're a property owner, if you've got problems now, then maybe things will get a little better later because you're, if you've got problems now, you're obviously somewhere between um, time two and time three when the bluffs are moving. But then conversely, if things are fine for you now that you haven't noticed change on your lot in a long time, maybe you're between time one and time two and things might not be quite as dandy as it were going, for, going forward. But again, it's very hard to predict how and when bluffs fail. It's probably impossible. But this is a very good model long-term, you know, explaining how bluffs sort of go back in a zigzag um, failure cycle. At the other end of the time, the time scale, so looking at seasons to years, uh, this is work done by Amin in 2001 in Western Erie County. Bluffs don't really follow that cycle. It's much more random. You know, we don't see nice times when the, we see the crest jumping as part of this failure cycle. Things are much more random in the short term. You know, we get waves chewing away at the toe of a bluff, like we see here. Um, and eventually that notch gets in far enough and might intersect uh, a fault or a fracture in the, in the till itself. And then the whole thing just falls out. And you see that in the West County a lot out near Raccoon Creek, if you're from the area. You'll have, you know, bar, well, <clears throat> shed size blocks of this thing, which is only here about 15, 20 feet tall, falling out into the lake. And then other times, you know, maybe the crest will climb back over time and will start growing vegetation. So it's very, very unpredictable because we've got, you know, the, when the lake is doing one thing, the groundwater can be doing something else, you know, to make the problem worse at the same time, or maybe groundwater mightn't be doing much at all. Maybe we're having a dry couple of dry years and all the damage is occurring at the toe. So we can get all toe damage, all crest damage, or some combination of the two. So very, you know, a high degree of variability in how uh, these bluffs retreat. <clears throat> so we'll look at the, move on and look at the causes for a little bit. Um, so, you know, some of you are probably wondering then why do bluffs retreat? And maybe for context, it's worth thinking about bluffs retreat, it's just what they do. They're very tall landforms. The fact that they're, they're there means they are eroding. And even though there's no data, no hard and fast data we have to, to prove this per se, if we, if we were out on Lake Erie 5,000, well, maybe 3,000 years ago, the bluff crest, the bluff where it is today would have been hundreds of yards, possibly a mile or two further out into the lake. Lake Erie would have been a smaller lake. And then since it filled, it's been pushing the bluff edges back over time. And then all that bluff material gets carried out into the lake, a lot of the fine stuff accumulates in very deep water, so we're actually making geologically the lake larger, but shallower over geologic time periods. So let's look at the causes for a little bit. So uh, this is what's called a Bayesian network model. It's a statistical model that 
Uh, what it's showing, we'll look at parts of it in a couple of minutes, parts in yellow especially, it shows all the variables that interact and are involved in bluff retreat. So obviously, not on this one, if you're paying close attention, is the groundwater has been removed at this way. It was just one iteration of the model. But, but wave attack would be on here. We know that that drives uh, tow retreat. We'd have groundwater should be on here, and that would be driving the crest back from the top end. And then there's other beach characteristics are very important. Bluff and beach characteristics. Uh, how resilient is the bluff? You know, is it, is it a mass of strong material in one watershed versus another watershed? Um, it, is there a wide beach? Is there a big pile of sand at the toe of your bluff? And generally that's a good thing. Um, is the bluff high? It turns out there's a relationship between bluff height and retreat. We're seeing that too. Um, uh, the toe elevation, how far is, is the toe of the bluff? Would you think the toe, of the, elevation, the toe elevation should be where it hits the water level, but if there's a big beach there, toe elevation is moved vertically away from the lake. So toe elevation makes sense because it's going to dictate how much um, wave impact the bluff will feel. And then if we've got bedrock, um, so the top of the shale elevation, how high the bedrock cliff is at the base of the bluff, that's important. So we'll look at some of these for a couple of a couple of slides. Uh, let's just you know see that how complicated you know predicting bluffs can be. So we'll look at waves first. So waves, yeah, if you live in a coastline anywhere, whether on the Outer Banks or the Great Lakes or Norway, you will you will know that waves are destructive. They, and they drive retreat by eroding the bluff toe. And, and universally on the Great Lakes, our wa most wave damage is done within the lowermost two meters of the bluff face. That's where we get that uh, wave cut notch being cut that digs in and then eventually the bluff just fails onto it. So less than two meters, less than six feet, more or less. So this is a picture of um, NOAA keeps track of storm conditions on, on Lake Erie and all the Great Lakes. This is a classic you know, fall storm. This one happens to be from October. Uh, 2018, we get big waves. We got 10 foot waves out in the bay, or out in the lake rather. Okay, uh, big waves cause lots of destruction. Uh, the Corps of Engineers keeps track of other wave related stuff. Uh, for example, from their data, this is a this is a rose diagram showing the dominant wave directions for different sized waves over the 1979 through 2014 time window. And it tells us essentially most of our waves come out of the west. 270, I think the real number is when you weight that is about 290. So, so from the west, northwest. And if you think of us sitting here on, on the shoreline, you know, that's essentially we're right, we're being attacked by waves on average most of the time. You know, this is not many times. Well, obviously, we're not going to get waves attacking our bluff coast in the southeast because that's land, but we get, you know, a small amount of energy coming in from the northeast from the Buffalo wind. Most of it is coming across from, you know, Toledo. Cleveland towards our coastline here. So we can, we can take this data then, this, this, this uh, wave, uh, storm wave data, <clears throat> and use an equation that's been developed in the literature relatively recently by the US, by some people at the USGS uh, Coastal Unit in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, it's called a run-up equation. So what, for right now, we'll just look at an example. So during a big storm, stormy seas, we might see offshore wave heights of three meters. And this H naught just means a significant wave height, which if you're interested, that's just the average of the 30% tallest waves. If we look at, if we plug these large waves into this equation and put in a certain beach angle. So beaches have different slopes depending on whether they're wide and flat or whether they're short, narrow and steep. It's this beta F term. We can figure out that when we have a big storm on our coastline, uh, particularly this storm because the waves are coming at us, um, it will cause runup on the beach itself of 2.3 meters. So just to be clear on that, a three meter offshore wave will run up across the beach and climb up the bluff potentially about 2.3 meters or 2% just means it's you know, there's more statistics, but it's the top 2% of those runup events, what the average is, they get pretty big. You know, it's a little less than the wave, not, not really important, uh, but the number is interesting because most of our bluff toes, the toe of the bluff where it joins the beach, is only about 1.2 meters is the average for the West County above still waterline. So you can see these waves are going to hit the bluff and then run up at potentially as much as you know another meter or so. Gravity's going to kick in there, but you know, so there's there's plenty of time when the toes of our bluffs, especially when there's no beach or a very narrow beach, are getting chewed on by waves. If you go, like Raccoon Creek is a good place to see that happen during a, a fall storm. <clears throat> So 
Yes, yeah, so let's, let's think about this for a second. So the, the, the wave energy is, is kept track of by the, the water, the, the wave information uh, studies group within the Corps of Engineers. They actually model the size of historical waves before we had instruments out there measuring how big the waves got. Because they have lots of meteorolog meteorological data, lots of wind data and so on. They can backtrack or back predict how big the waves were all the way back and at least going right now on Lake Erie, they're going back through 1979, which is very useful for, you know, coastal studies. So what we can do is, is use that equation, the, so the Stockton equation, um, and <clears throat> figure out how much runup we get on our coastline over time. So let's look at the top picture. This is a plot showing eight years of, so 70,000 odd hours of significant wave heights offshore. What does it mean? Well, it means, so we've got each of these, this is the number of uh, hours in a year. So these are one year increments going across here. You know, you see our wave energy hitting the coast varies. It's pretty high in the spring, drops during the, during the summer, rises up again in the fall, does that every year. And then most winters we get, it looks, wow, there's, there's no waves in winter. And that's because the lake is frozen. Okay, so here we see these time gaps, these windows. And then one year, um, I think this was particularly erosional year, you know, we, the lake didn't freeze over significantly. So it's very hard to pick to, pick out where one year ended and the next started because we don't have this gap in, in waves. Okay, so out in the open lake then, you know, you get waves up to about four meters, um, four and a half meters over here, you know, big waves, you know, ocean sized, impressive. And this is from one of their uh, wave gauges. It's actually a synthetic wave gauge, a modeled wave gauge offshore of Elk Creek, but it, it's good. It shows us how big the waves get off, off of the Elk Creek watershed. And then what we can do is we can take that wave information and <clears throat> just pick two sites here just to illustrate. We've got one site in um, Stake Amlands, right near the state line. And what we're seeing is over the course of this eight years, there weren't many events when, when waves actually hit the bluff. And those waves that did hit were not, you know, not very high. The run-up amount was not very large. So, so there's just have, one of our sites happens to be a not very wave active site. They're only getting, it's only, the bluff is only being chewed at by waves 0.3% of the time using this data set, or 216 hours out of 70,000 hours. And then another location, a little further east if you're from the area again, so Raccoon Creek um, gets a lot, much higher frequency of attack by waves, and those waves climb up higher, so they, they chew at the bluff more. So we've got that, you know, that's why waves are important. Some parts of the coastline, not so bad. Other parts, not good. So, if there's a moral in the story, then it's actually better uh, to live on a sheltered or an east facing bluff if you have that option, because then we won't be exposed to those incoming westerly waves as much as otherwise. <clears throat> so that's the wave story. Um, the next two items we're going to look at in one slide is, is the bluff tow height and the beach volume. So if you live on a bluff coast, you probably, you probably noticed during high lake level periods, the coast looks like this. You've got a steep bluff coming down to the water and there's, there's either very little beach like right here or no beach, okay? So tow height is important. Obviously, if we can, sh if we can shunt this tow away from lake level, that's good. We can do that in two ways. We can have lake level drop, right? We, and then we pull the shoreline offshore here or we can pile in sand here to basically work as a buffer for the bluff. And that's what we see over here on this side. Here's, you know, this is just, we could think of this as being a lower lake level scenario that's got a wider beach. Um, and now our bluff toe is, you know, a foot or two or three above the lake out here. So it's more protected. So we can say about the, the bluff toe height then and the corresponding beach volume is that uh, during high or rising lake levels, we will get more toe erosion because our beaches tend to get eroded away because we get reflection off of these bluffs and the bluff toe is right at the lake. And a good example of that is our current era from 2012 to 2020 up here on this plot. You can see the lake level has climbed steadily over the last eight years up to those record highs we saw last, last summer. <clears throat> Sorry, that was summer of, of 2019, right? It was when we saw those on Lake Erie. And then conversely, low and falling lake levels are good because they allow less, ero less toe erosion by waves right, because the shoreline's out here. It's harder for these waves to run up this beach and then climb up the bluff. And especially what we're looking at here is actually some shale bedrock and we see a waterfall coming out over it. So, and that's, that's you know, where in, the, in our record is that happened? Well, 
good examples in 1952 to 64, we had falling lake levels. So we saw the, we saw the water move away from the bluffs. And if we had the data, better data, we might be able to see that reflected in bluff retreat rates. They're probably slower during that period or not long afterwards. There's often a time lag between what the lake is doing and what the bluff is doing. Uh, that time lag can be pretty big uh, for the Great Lakes. It's ten, anywhere between 10 and 50 years. They haven't nailed that down yet. So what that means is, if you're thinking about lake level rising over the last eight years, we know, might not be seeing a lot of a bluff erosion yet because of this, because it might take several more years for the effect to be seen at the bluff crest, which is what we tend to notice as humans, because that's where we live. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, lake level, so these two are controlled by lake level. So lake level is important. It'll dictate you know, where, the, where the water is relative to uh, the bluff. So takeaway on that is it's better to have a big lakefront beach and a bluff tow well above lake level to at least have, be at less risk of, of bluff retreat on your property. Uh, groundwater is also important. <clears throat> that essentially is, is when water falls on the landscape, it, it percolates into the ground. And then if you happen to be in a watershed that's not well drained by a stream like this one here, this is a watershed right here that's drained my eight mile creek. The creeks are very good at pulling water from the water table towards the creek and that will, you know, Get, the, get rid of the water out into the lake via the creek itself. If you're in a watershed that doesn't have very well developed surface air, uh, surface drainage like the one I'm just highlighting here, um, not so good because now all the rainfall falling on that in that watershed, there's, there's no streams to go to. There's a couple of ravines right here, but a lot of that water is gonna try and bust out through the bluff face. So groundwater can be a very potent force also. And these are numbers that might make sense to, mo to most of you, but the relative numbers are interesting. You know, if we've well-drained watersheds, the bluffs on those, we can figure out they're, they're, they're cranking out less water through the bluff face. So the bluff would be more stable. If we go to like the Lewis uh, Road watershed <coughs> out near uh, 12, 12 Mile Creek, essentially, um, we'll have much larger amounts of water moving out through the bluff face. So the take home there is it, it's better to live you the choice in a well-drained watershed that's got streams because those streams will pull down the water table towards stream level and get rid of some of that water that otherwise has to go out the bluff. Uh, bluff resiliency, so that's an important one. You know, how strong is your bluff? Uh, we can measure that. Or at least get a good proxy for how strong our bluff is by using a very common geotechnical uh, approach that's used by every drilling company when they're putting in foundations. It's called the standard, standard penetration resistance test. And they measure that in blows per feet. Uh, we've, we've just converted that to blows per meter, just to be more metric about it. Uh, but it tells you how hard and how resistant the material is. They drop a weight from a certain height, and then they, they figure out how many blows it takes to go through that material by one foot, essentially is what it does. So we can measure, we can, we've compiled data for um, the resiliency of our bluff. So we know, for example, the bedrock toe down here has got a very high blows per minute value, you know, roughly 800, about an order of magnitude more strong than the very stiff lower till, which is one of our two till units. And then that in turn is about twice as strong as our, as our stiff upper till. And then as we climb higher in the section, we've got our lake sands up here, which are not very strong. And then not just not on this picture is our high stand pea gravels. They're actually very weak. If you've been on in areas where you we can find those like on the bluff or in some of the gravel pits in Erie County. It almost flows because they're not very well bound together. <clears throat> so it's good to have resistant bluffs. Uh, so it's better to live where you're with bluffs that don't have gravels in them would be one good uh, take home. And then also where shale bedrock is present because shale bedrock, you know, it's so strong. It, it's just going to erode much slower than, um, than the other materials. <clears throat> um, the catch, of course, is we've got strong materials, but think of all the rainfall falling up here becoming groundwater. A lot of groundwater comes down inside of these gravels and sands and hits the top of the till and it really can't go any further. Then it tries to bust out through the bluff face. So resiliency is good, but it also helps focus groundwater discharge, you know, at, at a certain elevation in the bluff. And that's, you know, it'd be nicer maybe if it could be spread out over more than the vertical section, because then you'd expect to see less uh, groundwater induced damage. And I think this is our last one. Yes. So um, shale bedrock is a good thing. Uh, this is one about 2.2 odd meters tall. 
in the West County, uh, shale bedrock is going to be good because it's natural protection, right? Uh, waves hit the stuff. It's not like hitting a soft, muddy till um, and washing it away. This stuff is aesthetically, you could argue, it's much nicer to look at. It looks like weather beaten rock, uh, more aesthetic than steel and concrete. So if you were putting in hard stabilization, you know, this is a much better uh, thing to look at. And it, it basically deflects the wave energy from doing destruction on your bluff. And you can see that here. You, you, if you look carefully, you'll see the lower part of the shale is uh, very smooth. We get a lot of gravel um, being picked up during these wave events, and they will basically sandblast this bluff. So if this, if this shale wasn't here, just think how much damage that would do to the bluff uh, glacial tills, which are sitting right above this. So in other druthers, is, it, it's better to live where a shale bedrock is thicker. So thicker is good. So extending further above lake level. So for us in Erie County, that gets about as high as seven meters above lake level. But if some of you live on the lake on Erie County, you'll know this place where it's 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 below lake level. It's if lake level is about 174 meters, it's not even visible to toe of the bluff, and you you probably notice more erosion at your locations. Uh, so we'll, look some, we'll take a slight detour, look at some uh, other interesting findings. So, so far, you know, we've been talking about bluff retreat and thinking, boy, it's not a good thing because it affects property, the acreage you own. And if your house is near the bluff, um, it threatens your house, but there is a good side, fortuitously. So if we look at Western Erie County, all of, the, all of this bluff retreat um, that's occurring, it all occurs in different watersheds. And we happen to have six of them in Western Erie County. And the interesting thing we found out is that um, the bluff erosion rate in each, in each watershed differs, and we can infer that based on how much um, material is lost from the bluffs. We'll look at how we get to that number in the next slide or two. But you can see each watershed here in Erie County moving from Presque Isle State Park westward, some of them crank out, you know, 2,720 cubic meters per year. Elk, Walnut Creek does less and so on. We're going to focus on Crooked Creek today because it's a very interesting one. So bluff retreat then is important because it will supply sand to our beaches on our coast. So if you like to have beaches, it's good to have bluff erosion. And then also this is the main source of sand for Presque Isle State Park, which is a long history of erosion because it's a very mobile landform. And what we found out is the, the amount of, of sand, boulders and cobbles, so sand plus, we'll see that term as we go through this, coming into the, the coastline in Western Erie County is only about 13,000 cubic meters a year, uh, based on a comparison of 2007 to 2015 data. That number is interesting because it's only 30% of what's been thought to be the volume coming in from Bluff Retreat in Western Erie County. And that in turn then has got implications for managers of Presque Isle. You know, if they thought they were getting 30,000 cubic meters a year coming to, coming to the park, that's helping mitigate some of the wave erosion. If they're only getting 13,000 relatively recently, that would not be a good thing. So it's, it's an interesting number. Uh, we're still fine tuning it, but you know, bluff erosion does help in other ways. It causes destruction, obviously, but it does help other coastal land features. So when we look at, uh, what, uh, we're gonna zoom in on, on, on Crooked Creek for a little bit. Um, extends from Crooked Creek here on the left to Elk Creek on the right. And what we did was we basically separated um, a 2007 um, digital elevation model made with LIDAR, which is like radar data, um, from a 2015 survey. And the net change between those two surfaces then on the bluff face, which is the brown colored stuff here, is, is, is the change on the bluff face. Okay, we'll look at a zoomed in one in a second. But um, this Crooked Creek watershed then is, is the most important one it's turning out to be because it supplies the most material of all the watersheds when we sort of normalize it to per, per kilometer of coast or per bluff kilometer of coast, about 700 cubic meters um, per year. And that's as much as 55% more or 200% more than any other of the five watersheds in the county. So it's turning out to be a very important supply of sand or source for sand that's eventually going to Presque Isle. So it's like, it's like one state, this is actually the eastern half of this watershed is Erie Bluff State Park. So it's like one state park is working philosophically to help another state park by supplying sand from natural bluff retreat, which you've been out there is, you know, looks very pleasant. Those eroding bluffs look nice and there's no infrastructure at risk unlike other locations. And this is the, the change map in a bit more detail 
uh, showing, you know, dark colors mean more erosion. So between 27 and 2015, a lot of erosion was occurring on the top part of the bluffs. Maybe that's good because we're changing this, we're making the bluffs less steep. And, and maybe then we could expect going forward, these less stiff, or sorry, less steep bluffs will be more stable, even though they've been eroding during this time period. And again, the amount of sand that this, this watershed supplies is a lot. It's about 30% of all the sand in the, moving along the coast here is supplied by the, crook, by the bluffs in the Crook Creek watershed, even though the watershed is only about 20% of the total length of the coast. So that was an interesting little detour on some other, you know, bluff related stuff. It's an upside to bluff erosion most people don't think about. Certain states do. Puget Sound, Washington has designated a lot of their bluffs when they can through acquisitions and so on as feeder bluffs or feeder bluffs where they will not allow development on the bluffs because they want them to supply uh, the sand to the littoral stream. So let's look at erosion or mitigation options for a minute. Um, I'm going to have to run through these a little bit, I think. Um, so we have in, in Pennsylvania, what we use is a long term, we, we, the state compiles, has compiled and does compile an, a long term average annual retreat rate. And for each municipality, they figure out what that average number is. And then they multiply it by some time frame. The time frame depends on the property near the bluff. Is it, is it a house, in which case they multiply by 50? Or is it an industrial setback or an industrial building, they multiply it by 100? to get this, an, an average annual retreat rate times time, and that will give them a number of feet of setback. Okay, so the state then has got regulations for minimum state setbacks for uh, different municipalities. And then down here in the graph, you can see the numbers kind of correlate with, you know, the most erosional parts of our county have the, have the biggest setbacks. Okay, and then what the municipalities are doing is they're they're making things, they, they can go beyond the state minimum requirements and say, well, instead of the state says we should build back 60, let's make it around, let's make it 200. So they do that. So that's one way of mitigating bluff retreat, at least for new construction by enforcing uh, setbacks. Ohio does something, something a little different here. What they do is every 10 years, they compile aerial photography of their coastline. And they figure out their goal is to predict where the bluff crest is going to be 30 years in the future. So on this map here, these red, these red lines, the, the white dashed line is the start point. Um, <clears throat> they try to predict where the bluff crest is going to be in 30 years. Then if you want to put a building anywhere on this patch of land that's between the present bluff and the one where they think it's going to be in 30 years, they allow you to do it. So it's not like our setback line. They allow you to develop uh, lakeward of their line, but the catch is you've got to put in uh, mitigation plans. So you've got to put, you've got to plan for putting in, you know, riprap, for example, toe protection to stop uh, wave attack at the toes. So they use a slightly different method, but the outcome is still the same. You know, we're, we're tr they're trying to reduce risk for property uh, developers, essentially. Uh, this one's just a little, di also different because they do this every 10 years. So, you know, looking at this map right here, this stretch of land is within a CEA, a coastal erosion area. If we came back and did this in 10 years, the CEAs can move around left to right. So your property in Ohio this year, if it's in a CEA, 10 years from now, it might not be, and you might be able to build without putting in mitigation. Uh, it's interesting how it works, but it's just, that's just an example of two different state approaches. Ohio also does this. They uh, recommend um, when you do the mitigation as part of, if you want to build in the CEA, um, they, they publish these um, engineering guidelines and their goal, one goal is to, is to basically take your bluff and make it a more uh, gradual slope. 26 and a half degrees is one common number civil engineers like to use. So you'll put in riprap at the toe to keep the waves at bay. You'll graduate the slope and then you've got, you know, a more stable uh, bluff face going forward. And then you can put your house up here on the plateau on top. Okay, so Ohio and Pennsylvania, a little different than what they do. Um, other states, so this is a longer, this, this seems to grow over time. Uh, Wisconsin, I think, is leading the charge on this, certain municipalities. California is doing it as well. They really pushed the California Coastal Commission. New York, Oregon, Ontario, its entire lake coastline follows this approach. And then FEMA guidance also recommends this. But so let's imagine this, make it simpler than it is because it looks complicated. We've got our bluff top, bluff crest, face, uh, lake, present bluff face. If we were in Pennsylvania today, we'd, we'd take our average annual erosion rate in one of our municipalities, 
multiply it by the lifetime of our structure. Is it 50, 75, or 100? And that would put us right here. We could build our property back here. This more conservative approach, first thing they do is they'll say, there's a present bluff face. Maybe it's got a slope of 50 degrees. That's not stable. We want to um, assume that bluff is going to regrade itself to a more gradual slope. And that 26 degree number we saw on the last slide is relevant. Some of the numbers get as, as small as 18 or 19 degrees. So we'll say, we're going to like put in an extra addition setback requirement that takes care of this stable slope angle. So we go from a steep slope to a gradual one. That's called the SSA setbacks, so the stable slope angle setback. We'll add that to the average annual retreat rate times time setback. Okay. And then we'll also add in potentially, this one seems to be more optional depending on where we are location wise. Um, this is basically fudge factor or space to move bulldozers and house moving equipment around. If, you know, 50 years from now you decide, well, I'm going to move my house back. So I want to get something in between the bluff and my house to, to shove it back. So when that method's used, it's, it's very conservative. And that's the pr arguably a problem with it because it consumes a lot of sand, a lot of land that you cannot develop on. So the conservative setback would put you way back here. And that could be hundreds of feet, you know, more than, for example, the current Pennsylvania or Ohio approaches, okay? So states are looking at this and I, I, yeah, it started off, I think in, in Wisconsin was where this was first sort of proposed and it's now a lot of uh, locations outside the Great Lakes Basin included are, are looking at it. And this is just some pictures, you know, what does this look like in real life? Um, regrading the slope, moving buildings back. It can get very expensive. These are big sort of institutional, um, ways of doing it, $4,000 a foot almost for um, Concordia University to put in, you know, gradual slope, put in protection at the toe, extract groundwater, limit run, uh, um, surface water runoff. And then similarly, I didn't, couldn't get the costs on, there's one not too, hard, too far from here in Painesville, Ohio, same kind of thing, toe protection, graduate the slope, move buildings back, you know, have this MFS space because um, they've already made the bluff less steep. And now you could argue this is MFS space or minimum facility setback space to move things in here to maybe shelve or drag this building away from the threat. Um, <clears throat> so our final slide. So some take home messages I just want to leave you with. Um, maybe before we get there, if you want to try some of these ideas on the minimum facility setback and how it affects, you know, maybe a property location, there's a very good site run by the University of Wisconsin geography department, you can plug in, you know, values for how high is your bluff, you know, what kind of slope does it have, and it'll spit out what your setback would conceivably be under, under this, this method right here, this, this conservative approach. So you can do that, it's worth doing. And then if you want to see, you know, serious bluff erosion, which we don't have, I just got a link here to a YouTube video, which is basically a drone flight up and down the coast of Pacifica, California. And I remember we were on a field trip here for a conference. We were able to stand on this Pacific beach underneath the swimming pool. It hasn't fallen in yet, but they've got serious, you know, bluff erosion problems with, you know, multi-million dollar relatively basic accommodations that are at risk, you know. So they've got Erie times, you know, 100 the size, the size of a problem. So take home messages. Um, <clears throat> management approaches to bluff hazards are evolving in the US and they're going the right way. We're, the goal is, as you might expect, to make things less risky for people moving into a bluff area or onto a property that's got a bluff and also for people who are alre already there. And Pennsylvania DEP in our state, you know, pushes that. They've got all kinds of recommendations on how to make, how to slow down bluff retreat in your property, you know, whether it's controlling leaky pipes, controlling surface runoff and so on. Um, having focused on the hazards of bluff retreat, you know, just keep in mind, bluffs can be can do good stuff. Hence that feeder bluff designation that Washington uses, and you know these bluffs are supplying sand at least for us to Presque Isle, which has got a sand shortage problem. That's why it's got an erosion problem. Um, bluff management, just thinking forward, you know, no matter whether we're in Pennsylvania or the coast of. France or Spain, you know, more data is, is always good. I think Pennsylvania in particular, and a whole bunch of states are still, they could do it a lot more ge in information on geotechnical properties, on how much sand is moving in the near shore, and groundwater mapping, very hard to do, because if you can map out where the, what the groundwater is doing in the subsurface on these bluffs, you'll know, you know, how much, how much pumping wells do I have to put in there to extract some of that groundwater to keep the bluffs a little drier. 
And then lastly, the more sort of, these are a little maybe up in the air because if you're living on a bluff already, you can't really do some of these, but if you're considering moving to a bluff, you can. Um, isolate your bluff from waves if possible. And that's what Ohio, you know, push, you know, put, put in tow protection down there like we see in California on the picture on the right. Uh, limit groundwater flow, they do that in Erie County. Some homeowners put in a groundwater extraction pumping systems, very expensive, but it's a way of drying out your bluff a little bit. Runoff's easier to manage, you know, you just stop any leaking septic systems or downspouts flowing out across your, your bluff face. Uh, you can reduce bluff slopes, again, expensive. This house really can't do it, right? Because if they reduce its bluff face, it doesn't have land to put the house on anymore. So there's a, there's a catch 22 to that one, but it does work at the institutional level where there's large areas of developable land. You can move the buildings away from the bluff. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, you know, the overall sort of message will be to move, move landward from the edge. The further you are away from this eroding, retreating landform, the better it is, you know, long-term because they're always going to erode unless miraculously lake level dropped a lot, but then groundwater is going to, you know, continue doing what it does. So I'll stop it there. I'll take any questions you have. And as, as Sean said, we can, we can follow up with any other questions after, you know, after, after today's session through um, filling out the Q&A responses. So I'll pass it back to Sean um, or to Kelly at this point. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, I appreciate appreciate your time joining us today. Uh, to give us an overview of some of these issues and, and some of the research happening. Very exciting. Uh, we did only have one question. Um, well, we have two now. Maybe more will come in now. Uh, so Shelby Clark uh, asked, are the drainage characteristics for each watershed available? Um, for example, well-drained versus poorly drained? Uh, that's a good question. The, answer, the short answer is no, not currently available. We just don't have, that needs to be compiled as it were. Um, so the, yeah, the answer is no, not easily, not yet. Okay. Uh, we have a couple other questions here. Um, so Colin Rowland, uh, he comments, really impressive work, Tony. Is the cited publication uh, FOIL et al. the 2021 publicly available? Yeah, uh, that's what a, journal is it? In? Okay, well, first step is in about four weeks it go it'll go on to the PA Walter site, so it'll be up there as a report for a project, and then over the course of the summer we'll have two publications out in, in a coastal journal. But in about four weeks, hopefully it's on the the Walter website. You can retrieve retrieve it off of that. Great. Okay, and then we had one more question. Um, are there joints in the bluffs that relate to falls? Are falls or waterfalls or faults? Falls, F-A-L-L-S. Okay, I'm trying to see, uh, find a bluff picture. Well, uh, <clears throat> let's see, in, in, our, in our glacial tail, so this, is, this picture here is, if you can still see that, I think I'm still sharing is uh, glacial tails, it looks like bedrock, but there are, there are, there are cracks or joints or faults in that, in that uh, till. But if there's, if there's a river coming out or a stream or a creek coming out across the till here, it's gonna cut down and basically, it'll be you know, a stream going from lake level up into the hinterlands. Uh, another picture I had was, let me find where that one was, we'll get waterfalls where a creek will cut down, it, it can only cut down as far as the shale bedrock, and then it's got to usually fall across the bedrock to lake level. So we'll see a small waterfall. We've got, we got several of those on the Erie County coast, but uh, where we don't have bedrock, then we don't have a waterfall. It'll just, the, the stream will, you know, fish can swim on it, sw swim up it rather. Hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, so we had another question from Michelle, and she's asking, how do groins affect bluff erosion and littoral sand flow? Um, the Connie okay. Harbor causing high energy waves, the Crooked Creek uh, within 10 miles, including high energy waves. Yeah, so call the map. Yeah, so Connie Harbor, yeah, when they put Connie Harbor in, before it went in, so in the late 1800s or mid 1800s, uh, the consensus is there was literal sand coming along the Ohio coast. And um, there was a number, 
the, the guys in Ohio figured out their bluff supply of on average about 500 cubic meters of sand per kilometer per year into the littoral system. So before Conneau was built, we had sand coming in into our coastline and that was good. Um, but since Conneau was built and then extended, it's now trapped a lot of sand. So the Corps of Engineers, yeah, the, the Corps of Engineers 2016 report on the sediment budget for Lake Erie goes into that in a lot of detail. They have lots of very good numbers, uh, but they realize that a lot of the sand is being trapped on the updrift end. There's some bypassing or transfer by, you know, bulldozer and, and, and pipes and so on to the east end. I'm not sure what those numbers are currently, but then some of the sand also gets deflected offshore by the breakwater. So it, it's impeding sediment supply coming into Pennsylvania from Ohio that would be doing so if the harbor wasn't there. But it's it's so old, it's grandfathered all the, you know, the like the NEPA requirements and things you'd, you'd catch in environmental impact statements today, but back in the 18, 1900s, you know, it was it was it was hard to, even though the you know geologists would have understood it or sediment, sediment transport, it wouldn't the project would not have been permitted. So that's Conneaut. Groins are are interesting because if you can just see on this picture right here, you know, we used to stick a groin out in the lake. It, it allows a nice wide beach on the updrift side. And if you've got a nice wide beach, it makes it harder for the waves to chew away at your bluff. So you could argue groins have a benefit for your bluff because they will keep the waves at bay, but then they're going to interrupt the literal sand transport system. They'll, they'll trap sand here that maybe your neighbor wants down coast here. So there's that issue. So like a lot of environmental things or natural things, I think technically the phrase is they're wicked problems. There's, there's, there's multiple causes, there's more than one solution, and the thing is to come up with a solution that, that makes most people happy, I think. Uh, but groins can, can protect your bluff from wave attack just because they'll trap sand on the updrift side and you see that here. Having said that, you can barely make it out, but the darker colors for the bluff face along here are telling us there's still a big erosion problem on these bluffs, and that's probably groundwater driven because it's coming out, it's happening on the top side of the bluff for the most part. Great. Okay, a couple more uh, questions we have here. We have a couple more minutes. Uh, so Tim Bruno asks, looking at the tow protection approach implemented by Ohio, can you explain how that affects hydraulic forces at the lake shore interface, as well the transference of energy to the perimeters of the protection? Okay, these ones, yes, yeah, so the one on the screen right now, this is a nice, it looks, even as a non-engineer, even as a non-scientist, you look at this and you think a big wave rolling in here from the right is going to roll up this thing and roll back. No, so it, it looks pretty aesthetically workable. Uh, it, conversely, if you put in a steel wall, like a seawall at this location, a vertical wall or even a more steep slope, they tend to be more destructive because a wave will roll in a lot of energy gets deflected downwards and causes toe erosion at, at the base of the wall of the seawall or the, if it was a revet, yeah. So basically it caused toe erosion and that eventually will lead, can lead to failure of the structure itself. So these sloped ones are what coastal engineers are favoring now because as the water runs up here, it's losing momentum, losing energy as it's fighting gravity and then it'll, it'll fall back down again, okay. And these structures in theory, because of that, should last longer as an engineering structure because they're not, it's not a vertical wall taking all of these pound, foot pounds of force and trying to distribute it to the lake bed and chewing away at their own structure. And generally they're, you know, it's like a hard beach. If you want to think of like a gravel beach or a boulder beach, they will, I mean, some of the voids might fill in with sand, but then once they're filled, you know, sand will keep moving along the coast so that you're not upsetting your downdrift neighbor but then the catch is, uh, they noticed that in, in um, Concordia University uh, location, eventually your, 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 um, your tow protection has got to stop because you can't, unless you're real, Illinois has, has a strong favor or is strongly in favor of armoring its entire shoreline as far as I understand. But most other states, you got to stop your, your structure at the edge of your property. Uh, there's property owners down here on the left side of this picture uh, they've been, they've, they've noted they're, they think they're seeing higher erosion rates because there's an engineering effect called the end effect on these structures where wave energy wraps around the ends of these things and will cut what's called a, uh, I'm going to draw, draw the blank on that one, 
it, it's basically a, a log spiral embayment, essentially, is what it is. You get a lot of energy focused right at the end, uh, right here. It'll cut back a lot, and then the amount of erosion will decrease as we go further downdrift. So yeah, there's like, a, again, a lot of these things, there's a good and a bad if you think about it uh, long enough. Great. Um, so it is a little after two o'clock. I believe Tony has agreed to stay on a, a little bit longer uh, and answer any more questions. I see we just have a couple more questions. Um, so I think we'll try to get through these last two questions, Tony. Okay. And then anything beyond that, maybe we can uh, get back in touch with with folks. Um, so Corey Snipes is asking, well, he first comments, great pe presentation, thank you. Um, can you speak to the importance of regular monitoring visual or measurement for property owners? Uh, yeah, so Corey, I got your email, thanks. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed today. Your real, regular monitoring is good. It's good to know what is happening at your bluff face. Um, ten, usually though, that's within, you know, states tend to do that do that service for their coastal residents. Um, the thing then is, are they doing it frequently enough? Um, because of, I think there's there's some accuracy limitations or resolution limitations. Uh, you know, if we're doing LIDAR surveys of the Pennsylvania coast, probably every 10 years would be, you know, would give us enough separation in some of these surfaces that would be able to pick out well where, you know, the erosional and less erosional areas are. Uh, doing it every year wouldn't be as productive, but some property owners want that, and there's there's actually a, a, like a niche market for flying uh, drones along uh, bluff coastlines to at least at the very basically just met, you know take photographic uh, visualization like the link at the end of the slideshow, or you know as as these drones get better and they're they're better piloted, you can start putting on uh, lidar systems onto those drones, and they would they would compile that radar imagery. Um, for people who want to reg, you know, monitor their bluff way more frequently than the state or the municipality they're in would, would do. So yes, monitor, regular monitoring is important. You know, the more data we have, um, the, better, the better our solutions can be. But as, as we know, you know, more data is, is more time and more dollars and you know, there's always trade-offs. So drones are being yeah, considered, I know, in, in, in various locations as a good way to, to track the, the kinds of change. Even, yeah, just I'd refer some of the viewers to the, the video at the end of, of the slideshow. Look at that bluff face in, in California, at least in there, you know, the homeowners can in theory walk down to the, the beach and see how bad, how much of their swimming pool is hanging out over the bluff. But for other people, they might want it done remotely. It's like, I mean, there used to be a, maybe it still is a trend for people like aerial photography done of their properties. And this is an adaptation of that where good data be, can be collected. <clears throat> Great, thanks, Tony. We have one more question. I'm not sure you'll be able to answer this, um, but Michael Reski, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. When can we see the lake level start to recede? That's a very good question, and the answer. <laughs> I'm smiling because it's it's like the best question that could be asked because it it makes a lot of our problems go away because it takes away the waves from the bluff toe. We still have groundwater, but it maybe it makes half the problem go away. When we Nobody knows. There's been a lot of research and NOAA does a lot of this, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, that's GLURL for short. Um, that's this link on the screen right now. Um, through those guys, they've had a lot of their, their guys publish in, in the journals on what they think lake level will do going forward. And there's like four or five papers on the topic. The general consensus was lake level is likely to drop uh, potentially on the order of two feet over the next century. Um, but again, you know, we're thinking that that's a long way to think out in science. Um, and that's the, that was a bunch of NOAA scientists. You might find other sources, you know, maybe academics who might think the opposite, but you know, I'm, I'm happy with this, this projection of a lake level dropping. If you look at it now, you can get this dashboard. There's variations of it that go back to the 1700s, but the data gets a bit more sketchy, but you know, we're definitely at a high lake level now. And we tend to go through these high lake level, low lake level cycles every every decade to two decades. So if it's ramping up now, and we've, we, we're higher now than we've ever been, maybe it'll start dropping over the next decade or two, and then it'll ramp up again. It's always cycles, you know, it's just constant. Um, 
Uh, the Welland Canal, interestingly enough, dropped lake level a little bit. It was a couple of, like it was an inch or two, something you would never notice. Um, but if we lowered Niagara Falls, it's possible, but that's a, that might never happen. Uh, we've got to wait for it to happen naturally. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you're go I think you're going with, yeah, lower lake levels is good for erosion. But when the, when the climate scientists have looked at that, what they've noticed is lake levels will drop because the planet's getting warmer. Uh, it's changing uh, precipitation evaporation in the Great Lakes Basin. So lake levels will drop in a warmer climate. But the catch is we get more, we get more rainfall in this warmer climate scenario. And that rainfall, a lot of it, more of it occurs during the winter months. So we recharge the groundwater systems more during the course of a year than we would now. So while you might, so if while, while lake level is falling under a warming climate, we're getting more water into our groundwater system and it might boost the groundwater um, destructive effect on bluffs. So again, it's, it can go either way. You know, there's, there's two sides to the story. But I, I'd like to see lake levels drop naturally. It would, it would solve a lot of, um, or reduce bluff erosion for a lot of people, um, but not really address what's happening with the groundwater up top. And that's about as precise as it can be on, on, on when the lakes will drop. They've been rising over time, you know, since the last ice age. But for us, when Lake Erie formed about 12 to 18,000 years ago, they've been, they've been rising and, and, and they just do this you know, on human time scales, this variation. And it looks like the trend I'm looking at on the screen, it looks like that could, could, could happily continue for many of our lifetimes. You know, we're looking way out to see, you know, if it is going to drop significantly and rise or rise significantly, it's beyond our lifetimes. You know, it's big nature in action. Great. So we did just get one last question that came in, if you don't mind answering this oh, no one problem. quickly, Tony, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, so Michelle asked, it appears that Conneaut Harbor is a major part of the cause of loss of sand in Western PA shoreline, eventually affecting shorelines eastward. Is there a program in place to recapture the sand and avoid having the cost of replenishing sand at Presque Isle? Yes. So yeah, the, the Conneaut let me call it, let me go back to my this image right here. Yeah, so <clears throat> the court these days, so so I, I've got to check with, um, I have a call into the Corps of Engineers to get precisely that information. You know, what is, you know, is the Corps planning on doing more sand bypassing around Conneaut? I mean, we, we do it on some of our smaller structures in Pennsylvania, like the marina down on, down towards 20 Mile Creek, where they come in and they'll they remove with a digger the sand on the updrift side, so on the west side of that marina, and move it to the east side. And that, you know, transfers the sand around the property. Uh, that just gets harder with a big structure like Kanya, because that goes out, is it a kilometer, out into the lake. But you look at all the big core projects on the Atlantic coast at inlets, where they keep them open for, for navigation. It's the same kind of thing. You're interrupting the literal um, sediment transport stream. And they, a lot of those, most of them will transfer sand from one side to the other when there is a documented, you know, shortage occurring due to the structure itself. And it's just our structure is different. It's, it's a structure in Ohio. They could very feasibly regularly um, bypass sand by the, if you've been to the East Coast, they use these big 30 inch diameter um, flexible pipes, the slurry pipes, they, they slurry it by. That's very, that's feasible to do from the course point of view. And that would mitigate um, some of the, the erosion that we're seeing on our coastline. Um, so was that, was there a second part? I'm not sure if I got to all your question. Oh yeah, how far downstream the effects were felt? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Yeah. That's very technical. Um, I noticed looking at our long-term erosion rates in the Turkey Creek watershed and the Crook Creek watershed, um, when we look at two of our long-term rates, I think we're looking at say uh, <clears throat> 1938 compared to 2007 versus 1938 to 2015. The longer time frame has shown a slightly lower bluff retreat rate. That's implying possibly that some of the sand now coming around uh, Conneaut, because I think there has been I don't know how much um, artificial bypassing that's starting to have a little beneficial effect on our coastline nearest to Conneaut, so in the Turkey Creek area. 
Um, right now, it's still it, it's still possibly noise in the data. It doesn't stand. It's not very obvious. Um, but any bypassing around Conneaut, that 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 would that would help Pennsylvania a lot because otherwise, that sand is getting trapped on their updrift um, on the upper side of their structure. It's great for them because they get new beach park growing every year in area, but they are depriving the downdrift state of a resource that interstate groups could argue, you know, we're due, we're due. Um, so yeah, an interesting question, very complicated answer. Uh, it's a bit like Presque Isle, you know, downdrift to Presque Isle. Um, <clears throat> you know, the dredge, the dredge channel at Presque Isle, that stops, that's continually, you know, I think is in the core going to dredge this coming summer, that stops sand getting to our easternmost coast. So a similar problem. Um, and a big one to answer, hard one to answer. But it's doable engineering wise. Um, it's just getting the people or the, the agencies to commit, you know, commit to pumping in a certain amount per year. What's interesting is back in, uh, there was work done in Presque Isle in the 80s. Um, they figured out the wave energy on Presque Isle is strong enough to be able to move 30,000 cubic yards of sand per year. So what that means is if there's less than 30,000 cubic yards of sand arriving at Presque Isle, we'll feel erosion more. And if there's more than 30,000 cubic yards of sand a year arriving at Presque Isle, we'll see less erosion because the waves can't get rid of that stuff fast enough. So any contribution to what we see coming in from our bluffs from the Ohio side would be good. It would make the problem smaller. Obviously, we felt first at Turkey Creek and Crooked Creek. Eventually, that effect, and we're to, this is probably at least a decade, maybe two, we might see the benefit being felt at Presque Isle. It might be three or four decades. Nobody really knows. Good question. <laughs> Multifaceted, but good one to think about. Well, thank you so much, Tony. I think we're going to wrap up at this point. I appreciate people staying on a little longer and giving uh, Tony a chance to answer some of these questions. Again, Tony, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. I'm glad, I'm definitely glad you're part of the Penn State family. Uh, also, Tim Bruno, who was on the webinar, thank you a lot again for your uh, support and patience over the past uh, few years. And I saw Shelby Clark was on the webinar. She's with DEP as well, and she helped me a lot with putting together an invitee list. And the last person before we leave, I wanted to make sure I thanked was Kelly Donaldson. She's the communications lead for Sea Grant, and without her expertise and help, uh, it would have been a struggle for me to get this webinar up and running, and especially running smoothly. So again, I thank everybody for participating today. And I hope we see some of you back or all of you back actually uh, February 26 at 1 p.m. where we will have Dr. Mike Neighbor, who is also with Penn State Barron, and he will presenting the results of a recent bluff recession analysis where he, we utilized uh, high resolution LIDAR data uh, to measure bluff erosion along the Lake Erie coast. So we'll be presenting the results uh, of that research project on February 26. And with that, I wish you all well and, and a happy weekend. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Tony. So I just unshared, you should be.